Techbusters, proudly brought to you by Ericsson. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> well, you make up your mind who wants to say it. Let's say good evening together. Come on, Toby. Good evening and welcome to... We're both so eager to get the show started. It's lovely to have you with us tonight. Welcome to Tech Busters and uh, lovely to have you with us tonight. We've got a great show pack for you tonight. We've got fantastic inserts, uh, some fantastic reviews that we're going to be sharing with you on the show and uh, great to have you with us. So we were both just over eager to get into the show, Mr. Shep. Oh, good evening. I'm so excited to see you. But uh, let's just take a look at what's coming up on the show tonight. Tonight on Tech Busters, we chat to Friedrich Yadling about Ericsson turning 140 years old. We jet off to Cape Town to attend the Yoko launch, the latest in payment technology. And Toby chats to Steve Watt at South by Southwest. All this tonight on Tech Busters. Ericsson, believe it or not, is 140 years old. And uh, can you believe that uh, they've been around for so long in the mobile industry? You think, well, you know, it hasn't been around for 140 years, but they've been doing other stuff in the past. And we in, stu in studio, we've got uh, Frederick Gedling, who is the president and the head of the region for Sub-Saharan Africa at Ericsson, to talk to us about the company, and especially this continent, because there's so many exciting things happening. Frederick, welcome to us. Thank it's you. It's difficult to believe that the company is 140 years old. I mean, where were the original origins? We uh, started out in um, Stockholm. Yeah. And that's a little small workshop, and uh, it's a family company that then uh, quite quickly expanded and uh, went through a significant number of transformation. And uh, what, is, uh, what is quite interesting, apart from the 140-year-old globally, we've actually been in Africa for about 120 years, since 1896. Uh, it's a tight race between Cape Town at the time and uh, Nairobi, where we installed the first switches. So we've been around for quite some time, and hopefully we can be in Africa for another 120 years. Maybe not with me, but uh, let's see. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's all about connecting people and, and your mobility report is always fascinating um, and, and what you're doing in, in the other countries around the world. But on this continent in particular, I find the mobility report quite interesting because Africa is very different to the rest of the world and we are emerging in different ways and innovating in different ways to the rest of the world. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And as a company, of course, uh, you're absolutely right. The industry is transforming and it's going faster and faster and faster. And there are a couple of milestones, of course, in our 140 year old history that uh, are significant, including fixed line telephony, 2G telephony in the, in the 80s, mm. mobile data, uh, Bluetooth, which is one of our innovations, and, uh, and then on to 4G and now Internet of Things and these things. And I think the thing is what on the base of that, what we try to do is to, we try to stay generally innovative. Mm. Uh, we, 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 have a, we have a way of working with innovativeness in the company, which means that we have a, an ability, it seems historically, to transform ourselves into relevant areas of technology. It's not easy at all, uh, but we, we believe that if we combine uh, a local presence together with technology leadership uh, and, uh, and uh, the service leadership we can facilitate with those in the basis, we uh, stay humble in, f in the future and try to in innovate ourselves all the time. So with big transformations going on. Yeah, I mean, let's just unpack up that innovation because every year when I go to Mobile World Congress or you know any of the big shows, Ericsson's always got this massive stand. You mentioned the Internet of Things, everyone's talking about this and there's different terminologies that everybody's using, but it's the, the notion of connecting all of these devices and on your stand, you had things from, you know, the, the these connected cities. Uh, you know, the automobile is very interesting. The work that you guys are doing with Volvo, which is also a Swedish company, and you talk about that innovation, and it really struck me. And I spoke to one of your engineers there that how they came up with the solution to sort out water pollution, for example, by putting tiny sensors in the river. That as soon as they pick up any kind of detergent, which is what comes out of drain pipes into the river, it will automatically send that details to the city, and the city will be alerted that there's some kind of pollution in the water. And this is the notion of connecting all of these devices and making things work seamlessly around us. No, I think that that is what we're talking about. Now, if you look at the I mean, we spent a lot of time connecting places uh, in the history. Now uh, we connect people through mobile tele uh, telephony. Uh, now the next step is, of course, to connect uh, devices. And, uh, and uh, in, as part of the 5G evolution, uh, which is a central part of Internet of Things, mm. uh, we see that most of the things that can be connected will be connected. Yeah. And that can, can include connected water, it can include connected cars, it can include connect whatever. Anything that benefits from being connected will be connected. That's what we, uh, what we say. And we firmly believe that. And I think. 
if you really look, uh, that is very much we were speaking about before about Africa, and, and Africa is of course going through that uh, transformation very rapidly as well because uh, a lot of the uh, infrastructure and bricks and mortar sort of business that has been there uh, will go digital a lot faster in Africa, yes, whether yes. that is banking, media distribution, uh, connected water, whatever it might be. And we see the rate of speed happening very quickly now. And, uh, the network growth that we see, the way we measure with megabytes, etc., is doubling more or less every year. So it's really happening right now. Well, this is what I wanted to talk to you about because I find your mobility report absolutely fascinating because you've been doing this mobility report for a long time now. Paint us a picture where we are on the mm -hmm. continent with the adoption of smartphones and these kind of technologies. Yeah, I, I would say that if we look at mobile broadband subscriptions, which are typically powered in the other end by a smartphone, we have maybe around 150, 200 million users today of smartphone subscriptions. So it's about 20%. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And the way we look at it by 2021, to refer to that mobility report, uh, we look at around 800 million uh, and, uh, and, and uh, more or less a full coverage of 2G uh, in terms of population coverage. So uh, they, we, we're going very rapidly. And this is the thing here that we went from a voice sort of uh, revolution for, mm. for the last 10 years, let's say, and the next five to 10 years will be the mobile data revolution. And all the industry transformations that come with that and that is the exciting part for us here in Africa. That's amazing. You know, that, that's a massive jump. But where do you see this uh, growth attributing? I mean, what's driving the, the growth? Obviously, I would imagine that you know the cost of the devices has yeah. come down. Yeah. But I see a lot of the networks spending yeah. quite a bit of money on infrastructure yes. and expanding yeah. you know, to 3G and 4G, yeah. for example. I, I think you've got to be very, a bit practical. You've got to start with the consumer in mind. The yes. consumer has an affordability level. And you've got to be a little bit careful to generalize Africa in that regard as well, because it's vastly different in countries and between countries so uh, if you look at the most the, the the price of the device is the most determinant factor as to whether how fast mobile broadband actually yeah. picks up then of course comes price plans uh, then comes quality of networks is super important uh, people typically don't churn because of price so much it's more linked to uh, the quality of the network, why people change networks. So the quality aspect is very important over time. But, but to make it really pick up, it has to do with the rightly positioned uh, price plan together with a reasonably priced device, which varies a little bit. That's amazing. And, and, and what, what, what's exciting for me as well is your, your last report that you released, and it actually makes complete sense what you're talking about. You're saying that if companies and organizations really apply ICT, and we talk about ICT, we talk about connecting people, we're talking about the services that are attached to these mobile devices, you can actually reduce the global carbon footprint by yeah. something like 15% yeah. by yeah. 2030 yeah. is what Ericsson is saying. Yeah. No, exactly. I mean, this and this comes into the next slide. I mean, it might have an empowering impact on people as such, the mobility and the broadband combined. But if we extend that into uh, into industries and what it does for industries and how it makes industry efficient, uh, overall reducing carbon footprint, etc., reduce travel, better communication means it has a fundamental impact. Uh, we see it in media distribution. In, uh, or, uh, in Africa, we have 15% TV penetration. Mm. And there long comes a disruptive technology that can distribute content to more or less all of those handheld uh, hand -held devices in, in, uh, in, uh, by 2021. So a lot of things is, are happening as we speak. And I think yeah. Um, financial industries will shape, uh, reshape themselves fundamentally with regards to this. And again, getting back to the point, if you don't have an industry established, the development is likely to go faster because the underlying need from industries and people and society is there. It's amazing. And I, and I, I, just, I, I also find it very fascinating that when you do these things, when you facilitate the availability of mobility, broadband and cloud, facilitating cheaper, more accessible storage, etc., you create an innovation platform that goes beyond companies like mine. Innovation is up for anyone. Uh, and uh, beyond the institution, beyond governments, beyond companies like mm -hmm. Ericsson. And the power becomes much more in the hands of people. No doubt. Uber, Airbnb are developed market examples, but there are several ones that have come up and will come up in Africa to that regard as well. It's amazing. Now, I want to share something with our viewers as well. I've been to Frederick's office and I've yet to see somebody's office that is tidier than yours. And I'm, I must just describe this and I'm not exaggerating this at all. Frederick's office has got no paper, he has got no filing cabinets, he doesn't even have a dustbin. He will just have a MacBook Air on his desk and that's it. Is that a fair description of your office? Have yeah, I missed it, anything uh, out? It, it still actually looks like that, yeah. And we, we had a policy in line with our waste and uh, treatment, etc. We removed the, uh, the waste uh, baskets in the offices a couple of years back. Uh, and. Uh, 
and uh, I don't print anything anymore. I, I, I try to work virtually and of course I got to live the story. So. That's amazing. I, I've never seen an office. I Actually, since I saw your office about two years ago, I've strived to do this, but I, I've not yet succeeded. But I'm getting better at it. But you, I use you as the benchmark. But uh, Frederick, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. And uh, welcome on board as the sponsor of TechBusters. Thank Great you. to have you with us. And we Appreciate look forward that. to many of more of your interesting reports and to see where the innovation is going and how it's changing the world around us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So the TechBusters team were in Cape Town recently for the launch of Yoko, another player in the online payment field and the invention came from a desire to help to help small business owners as a collective again technology being used to make our lives and the lives of businesses and small businesses in particular more convenient take a look at this is absolutely fascinating so Yoko provides um, one effectively one solution that actually is kind of a service so it's more than just a single product but the real sort of uh, I guess the basics of what we provide is we offer our customers a credit card reader that connects to a smartphone, Android or iOS, and together they form a complete credit card acceptance solution. We then uh, take the transaction data that they get from those transactions and we give them a dashboard and back end where they can go in and view analytical data about the transactions that they're doing and better understand their business. So that's kind of like the service uh, end to end. And I guess the one additional thing to that is we offer a lot of ease in the way that we provide that service. So, you know, signing up for the service is really easy. It takes them, you know, a very short amount of time. And I guess this makes things a bit seamless for them. So all in all, it's a very seamless, simple, fast to get going credit card solution. You're running a business. Um, you need to focus on making your product. You need to focus on um, marketing your product. And you need to then, you know, get customers through the door and then uh, convince them to buy your product and then you need to make sure that you can actually complete a sale um, and you know that last mile is extremely important but it's often overlooked and uh, you know to complete the sale you need to offer your customers a reliable way to accept a payment so it's a setback for a lot of these businesses when customers are trying to pay with card because they don't have cash and uh, that results in missed sales that results in um, uh, you know, delayed collections and, you know, cash handling headaches and all that. So, you know, we've decided to focus on that, you know, myself and my co-founders, uh, when we first started looking at that, we saw the gap. We realized, obviously, this was a huge problem. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's how, you know, Yoko basically came about. So what we've actually done with the technology is say, well, let's introduce a specific device that does very little, just the part of encryption for the credit card, and then let the smartphone do the rest. And the difference that brings to normal point of sales, that it effectively brings the cost down. So where before you'd buy the entire smartphone in your credit card reader, now the credit card reader just does one piece and your smartphone does the rest and you can choose whatever smartphone you want. So I mean on a technology basis anyone can access the technology anywhere in South Africa. Um, we do delivery all around South Africa and our online ordering system to actually place your order for the credit card solution is available to uh, anyone in South Africa. So I'd probably say what sets us apart more than anything else is our approach to having put the technology together. So when we started looking at the payment space, uh, we looked at it and we said, look, this is something that's very critical to a business. Um, so on the one hand, we wanted to make sure it was accessible to all businesses. But on the other hand, we also realized that this was a service that just had to work. Um, so this actually influenced how we built the technology. We built it at a very high quality level. And effectively, the technology really um, is robust. And I think you know, it sets us apart from, I guess, many other technologies in the similar space. So we support any Android smartphone, any iPhone uh, or Apple device, basically. Uh, we actually support not only credit cards, but also debit cards. Um, so you can use a, you know, a standard kind of debit card with our service. We accept swipe cards as well. We accept international cards. So any kind of card that's been issued by a bank, we actually accept them as long as it's Visa or MasterCard. We have algorithms running in the back of our system to actually help our customers with fraud to make sure that they're not getting defrauded as well. So the idea basically is that we don't just simply accept every transaction that comes through. Every transaction is processed, verified for you and we let you know if there's a transaction that could potentially be fraud as well. Um, so that's allowing you to actually prevent the fraud risk that you face as well. You know we, we are an African venture like at heart so you know we we our purpose is to you know empower the growth of entrepreneurial businesses um, in Africa uh, you know South Africa is a market that uh, it's our home market and we have a lot of work to do here uh, given the payment acceptance gap and uh, you know the large base of small businesses here uh, but you know I think the purpose is, is is really Africa for us you know we want to grow this into the continent and we want to solve the challenges of small businesses um, you know uh, across the continent
One of the smartest South Africans working abroad that I've come across is, is Steve Watt, who is based in Austin, Texas. And I bumped into him at the South by Southwest conference recently, where he's talking about disruption, or as uh, technologists of Steve's caliber call it, emerging technologies. This is a fascinating interview with a, a very smart, rugby-loving South African living in the States. Steve Watt, you're a South African who lives in uh, Austin, Texas, and this year you gave an excellent talk on this very trendy thing called disruption, but actually you, you've got another phrase for it. Yes, I think uh, in, our, in our industry, um, you know, disruption is the event that, uh, you know, affects your business um, and can sort of put you out of business um, from a particular disruptive technology. And the way in our industry, in the technology industry, the incumbent defends against that is a business unit called emerging technologies and that is what my talk was about and it's quite fascinating right like if you you know there was an age where you could be you know around for decades now it's much faster yes absolutely um, so you know the capitalist and economic uh, term to describe this is creative destruction and so if you look at S&P 500 data what you see is that there's uh, from 1900 all the way to say 2005 if you look at every 20 year slice you see a rapid acceleration where you would stay in the S&P 500 for say 90 years where today you know in 2005 you're only estimated to stay there for as long as 15 years so there's a strong correlation between disruption and you know time in the S&P 500 which means that there's you know some urgency in properly anticipating it and doing something about it so it, it, there's an incentive that if you do not do this you will be overtaken by an Uber or an Airbnb or as someone else absolutely right that's the trend right the trend is that you will go out of business and you actually have to be exceptional or do something different to stay in business and then the next step is that you've got to work out how to do it right absolutely and this is something that's really poorly understood in the industry right is that you know by and large most folks just wing it right or if they do anything right so the disruption tends to come in a blind spot for an organization and so the, the, the what you should actually do is create an emerging technologies function or a CTO office to actually and, and set it up properly within your company to actually ro respond effectively for it. And, uh, and then the next process is looking at all of these challenges and how to get past them. Right, absolutely. It's not just so much uh, creating the function by itself that helps you. You've got to structure this thing properly, right? It's got to live in the right place within your organization because there's institutional or systemic antibodies that come out because, you know, there isn't a desire to be disrupted within a company. It's deeply painful. So you actually have to plan for this thing properly. I mean, it's change management. We're terribly sentimental and we like the way we're doing it, not because it's a better way, just because it's the way we've always done it. Absolutely. Right, and um, you know, it's just human just to not want change, right? Um, but I think the other aspect is it's very expensive, <laughs> right? And um, there can also be, you know, strange emotional responses around people feel threatened, they feel like they'll lose their jobs, or you know, their jobs are shifting to other places. And so, it's really important to, you know, plan for this properly, organize the emerging technologies function in the right place, and uh, you know, set up the way that you communicate with the other stakeholders um, in a sort of known and efficient manner. As you can imagine, life isn't particularly complicated for sea slugs, or Aki Anastasio for that matter. They use their brains mainly to find food, avoid becoming food themselves, and to reproduce. While the human brain and nervous system are wired with hundreds of billions of nerve cells or neurons, sea slugs can get by with just a few thousand. But ironically, these slugs can tell us a lot about the chemistry of our human brain and our nervous system. In fact, they are ideal as study subjects for research on learning, memory, and how neurons control behavior because sea slugs' neurons form well-defined and relatively simple neuron networks. And because they are surprisingly large, these networks, they are giving researchers more material to work with, according to analytic chemist Jonathan Swedler. Ultimately, Swedler says learning how to turn specific chemicals in the brain on and off could lead to new methods for diagnosing and treating chronic pain, drug addiction, and neurological diseases, which is 
as we like to present here on Tech Busters, pretty awe inspiring research. And as soon as they've finished testing the sea slugs, I do believe they're going to test Aki Abastasio. Ha 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 ha. That's after they've done their like, main research on you, Mr. Shapshak, and they'll, they'll literally find nothing and then they'll search for some real intelligent life. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I feel sluggish sometimes, especially before I've had my coffee. But who knew these sea slugs would have so much to tell us about the human brain? Our brain and nervous system are wired with hundreds of billions of nerve cells or neurons. But slugs keep things simple with just tens of thousands. You know, when you talk about learning in a slug, you're talking about how to find what to eat, how to avoid being eaten, and how to find a mate and reproduce. You know, they're simple behaviors. So you can actually study learning and memory and how neurons control behavior probably better than any other creature. With support from the National Science Foundation, analytical chemist Jonathan Sweedler and his team at the University of Illinois are working to understand the function of individual cells in the nervous systems of slugs and other animals. So why study single cell? Trying to understand how, say, a muscle works and maybe individual cells aren't important, but in cases of cancer, when the single cell starts to mutate, then you need to go to the single cell level. They use a technique called mass spectrometry to measure the different chemical constituents in slug and other brain samples. Every one of these lines is a different chemical from the brain. So because of what's happened with mass spectrometry, the discovery of new molecules in the brain is really accelerating. Sweedler says sea slugs are a great model system for neuroscience because their neurons grow and grow throughout their lives. This is the nervous system of, of the Ephesia californica we are looking at. And uh, right here, you can see that some of these neurons can actually get quite large, uh, which makes it a little bit easier, gives you a little more material to work with. Learning to turn specific chemicals in the human brain on and off could lead to new methods to diagnose and treat chronic pain, drug addiction, even neurological disease and mental illness. And so we want to understand the chemistry. And more than that, we are discovering in every animal we've looked at new molecules that people didn't know were in the brain. Just as we find new molecules, there is actually the potential uh, for having a therapeutic effect. So next time you're feeling a little sluggish, take heart. They're smart enough to teach us a few lessons. Well, if there's one technology that fascinates Toby and I, and it is 3D printers, you know, I've been playing with this one over here, and we, we see these 3D printers in all the shows where we go traveling around the world. The reality is that they, they were quite expensive, and the prices have been dropping, you know, gradually over the last couple of years. And this is one of the first economic ones that has been made available in South Africa. It comes from a company called XYZ, and uh, this is called the Da Vinci Printer. And it's actually a very, very competent printer. Now, for those of you who don't know what 3D printing is all about, you can literally take an object that's been scanned scanned in 3D, right? You, you manipulate it on your screen and you click a button. So if you want to print a hose, for example, if you want to print a cover for a camera, if you want to print any object in 3D, this printer will do it. And how it does it, it uses this filament. We call this filament. And it's really a hardened plastic. If you can imagine the plastic on a Lego block, for example, this is the kind of stuff that it is. It literally goes through this process over the head of the printer very similar to a, a printer that prints on paper, but this prints out in plastic. So this high, uh, this plastic that's really hard is heated up, it's melted, and then it prints it in the shape that you want to print it. Um, now, this particular printer doesn't have the 3D scanner built in, but the one that's above this, it's basically the same size, has got both the built-in 3D printer as well as a scanner. So you can actually scan a physical object that you want to print, and you can print it. But now you can download stuff off places like Thingiverse and print it. Now the, the great advantage of this particular printer, apart from the filament, which I just showed you now, it uses two kinds of filament. It uses the ABS filament and the PLS filament. Now the difference between the two kinds of filament is that the ABS is the, the harder one and the PLS is the softer one. So the point is that it gives you the opportunity to able to print two different types of plastic. And the reason why it does that, the other one which is harder is longer and hardier if you're using it for clamps and that sort of thing. And it requires a higher temperature to melt in order for it to print on the printer. So a really, really cool printer and it comes in at a really good price at 10,000 Rand. So for the first time, it allows and gives the opportunity to hobbyists 
to start playing and in the realm of 3D printing and it's not out of the price range of those hobbyists. They also make a smaller version of this printer, kind of like a baby desktop version. This is a, a nice size, you can see that inside the box of this printer it's able to print objects up to 20 centimeters high and 20 centimeters wide. So, wide. so it literally prints them on that table. It takes a bit long but it's the most amazing thing in the world to see something coming to life created via this technology um, from your computer screen using plastic filament coming out in a few hours time you have you have something printed so uh, Toby I was over the weekend playing with this I broke one of my clamps um, of my hose pipe and and it built his warehouse it already closed so I went online I found a similar clamp I printed it and it came out on the screen um, I also did the same with a GoPro casing um, you know, I had to do a protective casing on the GoPro, found one online, downloaded the image, printed it on here, and presto, I had the, uh, you know, a, a prototype real casing in a matter of hours. That's our 3D printer review of the week. It's the XYZ Da Vinci printer, and it goes for 10,000 Rand. Thank you for joining us. That's it for tonight's show. We'll see you again next week. We'd also love to hear your comments on the show. Email us on techbusters at abn360.com or tweet us at techbustersSA. He's at Aki Anastasio and I'm at Shapshack. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Yeah, like, I mean, that's... Uh...